Well, uh, thank you very much to take your time to talk with us this morning here in Rio. And we would like to ask you some questions about your work on safety. Okay. Uh, the first question I would like to ask you is what is your definition on safety? Okay, uh, I'll try to answer that. And actually, I have two definitions of safety because I think that two different types of safety. Uh, and uh, we, we now we call them safety one and safety two for, for short. Safety one is the type the, is the understanding of safety which is we traditionally have, which which we have used for many many years, and the, the understanding which we find in in definitions of safety from formal organizations and, and from guideline documents, and this basically says the system is safe if the number of things that go wrong, accidents and incidents and so on, is as small as possible. So safety, one way of phrasing it is to say that safety is the freedom from risk and accident. Safety is the absence of accidents and risk. And the purpose of, of safety effort is to reduce the number of things that can go wrong. So this we call safety one. It's, it's like avoiding the negative, eliminating the negative. But we have also, through resilient engineering, come to the realization that there is another type of safety. And this is what we call safety two. And safety two is when things go right. So the purpose of safety two is not to prevent things from going wrong, but to make sure that things go right. So safety is when things work. And in some sense, the two definitions say the same thing. Safety is when things work, but the difference is that safety one tries to achieve safety by eliminating cases where things go wrong, where safety two tries to achieve safety by facilitating situations where things go right. So it looks at the positive, it tries to understand why things work, and tries to find ways of improving the way things work. Thank you for your explanation. It's certainly a shift on the way we, we think about safety. And how would you think of safety in health in healthcare, and how does it compare to other industries? Well, I think it, uh, first of all, it, it's, if you want to just go back to the definitions, and I think if you look at the definition from uh, the WHO, and they say that health is more than the absence of illness. And that's exactly what safety two says. It's, it's more than the absence of illness. Safety is more than the absence of, of, of accidents and incidents. So I think it's very appropriate that health healthcare actually has in its own definition of health, the positive side, emphasizing the positive side. And that's what medical professionals try to do. They try to improve health and not just to, to fight diseases. But coming back to healthcare and, and other industries, uh, healthcare is sometimes or is known for having a higher risk probability than many other industries, which I think is due to the nature of healthcare. It's it's obvious or it's natural that healthcare tries to compare itself with other industries, particularly aviation. Uh, but then, if you look at other industries, then you, will, then you notice they also try to compare themselves with other industries, like nuclear compares itself with aviation, aviation actually compares itself with nuclear, with, with, the, with the production industries, and everybody tries to compare with somebody else because nobody is satisfied that they are good enough, and they try to learn from others. Healthcare tries to learn from others also. And, and I think that's quite natural and it's very important. I think what is one what should be careful about is to only learn from other industries where it's relevant to them. And by that I mean that you need to understand what healthcare is as a as a process, as a function. And it's different uh, 
very often you, when you talk about quality, you say, well, look at McDonald's, look at the quality of producing hamburgers. Uh, can't we do the same thing in healthcare? And then you should realize you're not producing hamburgers in healthcare, you're treating patients. Some aspects of healthcare are like producing hamburgers. It's standardized processes and it should be standardized processes. Other aspects of healthcare are completely different and you shouldn't try to compare to industries that are not that are, that are different from healthcare. That's why in particular there's a, a lot of comparison with aviation. You say why is aviation so safe when healthcare is so relatively unsafe? But if you look at aviation, if you take aviation in Europe for instance, there are about 15 to 20,000 starts and landings every day. But every start and landing is the same. You start, you roll out, you climb, you fly, you approach, and you land. It's the same process for every flight. And of course, you can standardize that. If you say a patient comes to a hospital either to the clinic or to the emergency department, it's not the same patient, it's not the same type of patient, it's not the same type of illness, it's not the same type of complaint. You you don't you have to find out what is wrong, you have to treat it and you have to look for complications and so on. You cannot standardize it in the same way if you talk about direct patient treatment. So comparing it with aviation is a mistake. Treating patients is not like flying an aircraft. We don't have standardized airplanes, just uh, yeah, patients, just as we have standardized aircraft. If you have standardized patients, maybe you could compare, but you can't. So, and what is the role? How do you see how safety to see uh, variability um, across uh, processes and professionals uh, okay. in relation to safety? Yeah. I think that that's where there is a difference between safety one and safety two because in safety one uh, variability is, is seen as something negative. You, you, you do not comply with the rules or the procedures or the principles. You, the term is you deviate from the rules, you break the rules. Whereas safety two will say, well, variability is necessary. If, if there was no variability, systems wouldn't work. Uh, and it's obvious when you begin to look at what people do, you realize that all they do is trying to adjust their work to match the situations, adjust or improvise whatever time you, you term you want to use. But it's critical that we are able to do that. We are able to do it very well as a, as individuals, as as social systems. But variability is essential for safety too, because safety too is the ability to succeed, and you cannot succeed unless you adjust what you do to the conditions because the rules, the regulations, the procedures are never precisely what they should be. This is, or you can also say the situation is never exactly as it was anticipated in the rules and the regulations and the procedures. So variability is essential, it's absolutely necessary and it is and the human ability to adjust is, is, a, is a great asset for safety and we should understand that, we should try and understand how we do it so we can also try and understand why we do it and why we do it in certain ways and what the possible risks are in that because our risk is that, obviously. How safety too can prevent accidents? Well, I think safety too can prevent accidents in a simple way. You can say, if you do things right, then you don't do things wrong. You can't do something right and wrong at the same time. Uh, and if you say that, then of course it becomes natural to say, why don't we try to do things right? Which is what safety too says. In addition to that, you can say that whereas safety one is, is a cost, it doesn't contribute to productivity. In fact, it makes productivity more difficult because you have more rules, and more barriers, and more regulations. Safety two actually increases productivity because it tries to say, how can we do things right? How can we be better at doing things right? So safety two actually enhances safety and enhances productivity at the same time. Do you have a benchmark for safety? That depends on whether you ask me about safety one or safety two. Let's talk about health system. 
what would be the benchmark for health system safety? Well, as you know, there are there are different benchmarks that people already use, like like uh, the number of, of failures, the number of deaths, and so on. And we need to reduce the number of deaths, the number of bed ulcers, the number of falls, and so on. Uh, but I don't think that's that's a proper benchmark because the proper benchmark will, will be to say, well, how can we keep people healthy? How can we keep them in, in, in good shape? How can we improve their condition? And I, and I think the, the benchmark would not be the benchmark in the classical sense as a, as a value, as a limit you have to reach. And once you reach that, you, are, you can rest because now we're good enough. The benchmark is doing things as well as possible and being as, as good as possible to adjust, to improvise. The benchmark is being able to learn as much as possible from what happens, from things that go right and from things that go wrong. The benchmark is to be able to keep track of the situation and see things coming as early as possible and being able to adjust what you do to meet that situation. So to me, the benchmark is in a sense the quality of the performance of the process, not the quality of the product, but the quality of the process. Just one more question is... Oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, that's... Uh, is, uh, we know that uh, uh, resilience engineering is is the I don't know if I can see if uh, it's a model, it's a theory behind uh, safety too. So as we're talking to healthcare people, could you give uh, give us an idea of what is really resilience uh, engineering? Okay, well, resilience engineering, I would say it's, it's to me more a way of thinking, it's almost a philosophy, it's a way of looking at things that happen and look at them in the way where you try to see what works and not only see what doesn't work. Resilience engineering is being used in healthcare now. We actually have something called resilient healthcare. We have a network, international network of people working that were interested in using resilient engineering in healthcare. We had actually a meeting in a two-day workshop in Denmark on resilient healthcare with people from, from all over the world. Uh, where we discuss that uh, and, and uh, where people try to see, well, how can we improve conditions? How can we improve work? How can we understand the variability of work rather than looking for failures and causes of failures? How can we learn? There have been examples on, 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 on wards, for instance, in the distribution of medicine that people say, well, this is how I do it. And they discuss and they say, well, this is a good way of, of doing it. And this is how we can achieve better performance, both in, in terms of productivity that it takes doesn't take as long and there are, there are fewer mistakes made, but also in terms that the quality of performance increases it's by looking at what happens and and there are a number of, of initiatives a number of, of uh, projects that are starting to do that some are already ongoing so thank you very much thank you for thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.